Fatma Memorial Hospital. Fatma Memorial Hospital because uh, as you have already come to know and most of the faces, uh, faces here are quite familiar because we have been having some interactive seminars in the past as well and I'm working in the family medicine department as the uh, initial <laughs> member and I would rather call I was the head of the department with only two members one medical officer and one myself and now it's growing and expanding which gives me very much a heart pleasure now uh, the topic which has been assigned is I hope my voice is okay it's not too loud it's okay right so the topic which has been assigned to me is approach to dyslipidemias, metabolic syndrome and obesity. And I think day in and day out we always hear about it. But uh, the dilemma is that it is never very adequately treated. Even in the best of hands, even by the best of specialists and even in the best of countries. So obesity, metabolic syndrome, dyslipidemias, it's still a worldwide problem, more often in developed countries and of course coming up as a more problem now in the developing countries. Uh, next. So because this is an organized course and it's just not a lecture and by the end of the day we are all very tired so I would like this um, uh, to be as much interactive as possible and at the same time I would like that uh, by the end of this uh, session the participant should be able to understand the comprehensive approach to metabolic syndrome and understand the significance of risk factors in the management of metabolic syndrome which is important and educate their patients convincingly. The word convincingly should hold more stress. Next. So these are pictures we see every day here and there is just to lighten up the mood but I don't think this is very rare to see. Next. And uh, obesity or dyslipidemia or gain in weight or metabolic syndrome, um, they are all interconnected in one way or the other. The gain in weight or increasing weight is not a disease in itself, but it perpetuates in so many ways that it interacts one factor with the other and it addresses and multiplies the diseases. So you can see that the insulin resistance is more in these people, obesity, the body mass index keeps on increasing, waist hip ratio, and the lipids, the HDL cholesterol uh, keeps on decreasing, cholesterol on the higher side, triglycerides on the higher side, and all this phenomena leading to atherosclerosis and coronary vessel disease, leading to high blood pressure, angina, infarction, ischemic heart disease, and whatnot. Next. So uh, we have uh, these three things are actually quite interconnected. So we have to address the problem as a whole and we have to see how we have to analyze and see which patient falls into which group. So metabolic syndrome as by definition, a syndrome X, what is there? There is a central obesity also called as an apple type of obesity, a high blood pressure, high triglycerides, a low HDL which is also called as the good cholesterol and um, insulin resistance is there. So when all of these factors are present, it is addressed as a metabolic syndrome. Next, excess catecholamine syndrome, diabetes, lipid disorders, all these are predisposed in one way or the other when patients have got increasing weight and when there is insulin resistance and hypertriglyceridemias don't have to go into the details but you can see that all these things are interconnected because I'm not actually delivering a lecture we are trying to sort out a clinical approach to the patient next so how to go about first of all we should analyze the problem naturally the patients that we are addressing are patients of overweight dyslipidemia or the patient with metabolic syndrome or obesity all of them are overweight you have to assess how much overweight the patient is you are busy general practitioners you don't have so much time to sit and analyze so many things so at a quick glance it's important that you see the patient you are addressing is mildly overweight moderately or grossly overweight and that will give an idea that what type of patient is under our care and how we have to do it. Body 
mass index, I hope you know about it, the height weight, height in uh, centimeters over weight in meters square um, gives you the body mass index. Ideally, it should be less than 25. 25 to 29 is overweight. More than 30 is obesity. We all know it. But uh, you have to calculate the body mass index and see whether the patient is mildly overweight, moderately overweight, or the patient is an obese patient under consideration. Generalized gain in weight or there is an abdominal obesity. You have to see whether this gain in weight, if it is generalized, there are even certain drugs which can give rise to gain in weight. There are diseases which can give rise to weight, gain in weight. They have naturally the dietary habits, modification, lifestyles and so many. And the generalized gain in weight is not that dangerous than the abdominal obesity or the apple type of obesity because that predisposes much more to the coronary vessel disease and its added risk factors. Then once you have analyzed this patient has got overweight, you have to see is it just overweight or if the patient has got comorbid conditions. If the patient, many people will just come up, I just want to reduce my weight. Are you suffering from anything? No, I'm not suffering from anything. But I've heard of so many things about going this, that and all and diabetes and hypertension and ischemic heart and I want to save myself. So you have to take the first factor into view whether this patient is just overweight or do the patient have comorbid conditions which again hypertension, diabetes, ischemic, coronary syndrome, angina, MI and so many others to list on. Then once you have analyzed this, this factors, you think your patient has got a stable disease. Patient may be hypertensive, patient may be having diabetes for last 10 years or ischemic heart, but the patient is doing fine, he's on medications and all that now he wants is that he wants to reduce his weight so that his added risk factors become less. Or the patient under consideration has got an unstable disease. If the patient has got an unstable disease, which means that there are recurrent symptoms of coexisting condition despite medications. The patient is hypertensive, he is on medication, but the blood pressure is not controlled. Patient is diabetic and just like you pointed out very uh, nicely in this scenario that the hemoglobin A1C was 10.1. So patient is diabetic but the diabetes is not under control. Do you have to address this problem or do you just have to address the gain in weight or you have to just look for the weight reduction? Naturally as a patient you have to address the whole problem. But because the questionnaire, you have to see the question because the tricky questions are always there in the exam and more often it is a little shifted from the real scenarios. So if they are asking you that how you will manage the obesity or how you will manage the metabolic syndrome, giving insulin or giving anti-oral and anti uh, hypoglycemic agents is not addressing metabolic syndrome. So with that scenario, the answer was not to add any insulin or anything like that. But of course, as a patient, you will think about those things. Then desires of the patient is very important. Everybody would like to be slim and smart and be an ideal body figure. And uh, when you address the problem, when you tell them, this is what you've got to do and this and that, and then they will say, well, that's very difficult. Give me just a pill and I think that will be the best answer. So if you're wasting your time over the patient, see the desires of the patient, the seriousness of the situation, the reality of the situation, how vigorous an attempt the patient is willing to make with you. It has to be a cooperation between the doctor and the patient. It's just nothing that you just address the problem that this is your lifestyle, this is the exercise, this is what you want to do, and the patient will go home and do everything. It's very, very difficult to lose weight with whatever maneuvers we have currently. And then desires of the attendants, because most of the time the parents will come up that the child is overweight, but the child is not willing to lose weight because he is fond of all the junk foods and all and he is not going to listen to anyone. Or the husband will be there saying the wife is overweight and I want that why she is getting so much weight, doctor look after her. Or it may be vice versa, naturally husband is overweight and the wife is worried that he is already uh, coming up to an age where all the diseases will be addressed. So so you have to analyze the problem with all these things and seriousness of the situation. If the patient has comorbid condition, if the patient has got unstable disease, the seriousness of the situation is more to be addressed. Next. 
So just the very basic parameters, but we have to probe into the problem. History of the patient, you have to go to the details of the patient. And with the history, naturally the duration, when the patient started getting weight, how it started getting weight, is there any conditions associated with that? And um, is there any changes in the lifestyle, retirement or whatever it is? And important events where the patient may have felt into depression and started overeating or anxiety with overeating or the patient contracted another disease or there's some family conflicts going on and the patient gets a consolation on eating food. So all these things are really important when you go into the detail, though it doesn't look to be very valid, but they are very valid. Then individualization of the case, you have to think, we are addressing the three basic problems, whether there's a family history of dyslipidemias, or whether there's comorbid conditions already going on, running in the family, or the patients having all this, this. So you have to make your case individualized, you have to see whether the patient has dyslipidemia going on in the family, patient has heart disease in the family, patient has got obesity running up in the family, or there are diseases which is there in the patient itself where you have to think of all these things. Lifestyle of the patient, not going into the details but you all know it. Sedentary, moderately active, active lifestyle. Some of the patient will tell you but I've got a very active lifestyle. I'm a businessman and I'm all the time on my feet. I, I, I hardly sit for even an hour but you can see uh, the way I'm getting weight. So it's not always that all the patients are sedentary or inactive. And the degree of exercise, whether routine exercise has been taken or not, because only if you take, get all these things from the history, you can formulate in your mind, in your brain, that what can be advised to the patient. If they're only taking exercise and we have not asked, and later on we say, well, it's better you go for a walk. And they say, well, that's I'm doing, doing it for the last two years, but that's of no benefit. And meal times and habits, how much the patient is taking, how frequently taking, what type of meals is taking, how much is fond of eating and all those things. Because you have to address this problem and you just can't uh, stop everything there. Be, being a doctor's advice, nobody is going to listen to that. Job description, full time, partial, dietary likings, predilection for fatty foods, fights and all those things. And if the patient is really overeating, and adjustments possible. You have to think in your mind when you are taking the history that are these adjustments possible in this particular case? Because you are dealing practically with a patient and you are dealing with one patient at that stage. You are not dealing with a disease. You are thinking this patient has got metabolic syndrome or a dyslipidemia or the patient is obese and how I am going to chalk out the plan, what type of likings he has and how I am going to make him convinced that what he has to do with the modifications. Next. Then of course examination of the patient, general appearance, you can make a spot diagnosis if the patient is for example like cushinoid, hypothyroid, metabolic syndrome, gross capacities, this can just be picked up at a general appearance. And then you can go distribution of the fat whether generalized or abdominal so that you can pick up your differentials. Assess the height, weight and body mass index, that is a must when you are dealing with this type of patients. And that's very easy because you have got a scale, weight scale with a height adjustment on there and you can just formulate and get your BMI. Detailed physical examination, general blood pressure, stigmas of chronic disease, systemic, all these things has to be very quickly looked up. Then assess the comorbid conditions, I've already given you details, whether it's stable, unstable, how seriousness is, it, how much the patient is looking after that. And you have to analyze the risk stratification. And you have to tell the patient, if they've got more than one factors, of course it's going to be a synergistic or an added risk factors. Patient having one disease is at less risk, patient having no disease, but just having an abnormal lipid profile is at still lower risk. But if the patient has got two or three diseases going on, naturally the risk is all additive. Next. So next is the investigations. Lipid profile, uh, I'm not going to the all the long list of investigations, we are addressing the specific problem here. So that is understood that you will go for whatever CBC, ESR, this and that. But when you're addressing this problem, what is important investigations, we have to think over it. And as a general practitioner, 
you have to see that how much is the problem, what is the problem, and how we can tackle it. So the lipid profile is there, apart from the simple investigations for whatever the condition patient has, but for this uh, specific uh, thing, you have to think for the lipid profile, where you have to assess the cholesterol levels, the blood cholesterol, not serum cholesterol levels, triglycerides, high density lipoproteins, LDL, and intermediate density lipoproteins. And uh, the blood sample is collected in the fasting state, so the patient has to be advised that, but usually the laboratory people advise them. Isolated defects can be there. The patient may be having just hypercholesteremia, hypertriglyceridemia, or there could be a combined elevation. And what is more important is if the patient even has a normal level of cholesterol or a normal level of lipids, but the patient has got some comorbid condition, age-related especially, then uh, like if the patient has diabetes, then even a normal lipid profile has to be treated. And I'm sure this is coming up in the latest guidelines. And the reason for this is that there has been a lot of studies with a lot of evidence-based medicine that if the patient has even got a cholesterol level of 150, which is taken as the upper limit of normal, the um, uh, the uh, densities of the molecules inside, they, they are more dense in patients with diabetes than in a normal individual. For that reason, the same level is more dangerous for patients with diabetes. And you have to add a drop fall effect from the initial to a 30% drop fall effect gives a lot of benefit to the patient. This is latest evidence-based medicine. And this is the reason that diabetes patients have, uh, statin has become a mandatory treatment in diabetes now. Doppler studies in selected cases, of course, when the patient has got all this profile going on, uh, the fat is going to deposit where more often in the blood vessels apart from the um, depots of the body and other. So the patient will have stenosis of different vessels, carotid artery stenosis can predispose to stroke, coronary vessel disease, and peripheral vascular diseases giving rise to, again, the complications. So Doppler studies, non-invasive, is important in most of these cases where it's really needed so that you can give a secondary prevention to that person. Intravenous ultrasound is a new technology and I had slides around but again I don't know how much timing is there and it is being done in PIC so it has been done in the hall. Intravenous ultrasound is a device where you can actually go inside the vessels, the coronary vessel, you can measure the plaque size and you can um, you can actually diagnose the patient before obvious stenosis of the vessel has taken place. Obvious stenosis like more than 30-40% when takes place that comes on angiogram. But when the plaque is there and distributed and there's like a 10% stenosis or a 15%, you can actually measure that this throma is coming in. And in due course of time, the patient is going to get a stenosis of the vessel. And this is a very, I mean, again, useful device. And with this device, there has been one or two very important studies, which is one is the reversal trial, where drugs are given and the plaques has been reversed. So the patient does get better. Of course, it is a specialist uh, test, no doubt. This is not for general practitioners. But you ought to know these things, because if you know, you can only refer it then. You are the first-hand approach to the patient and if you think that the patient is having all these complications and is bound to have a coronary vessel disease, you can at least advise or refer to a specialist or if an IV ultrasound report is there, you can at least read those reports and see that what can be done next for the patient. Then angiogram, coronary, other vessels like aortogram or renal artery or whatever um, can be done again in selected cases. And relevant to the comorbid conditions, you can do the investigations. So this is a small file of investigations which has to be done in these settings. Next. 
Next we come to the management. Once you have taken a good history of physical examination, investigations, you've come up, you've built up your impressions. So we start managing the case. What is the purpose of managing? Increase blood cholesterol levels, especially high levels of LDL cholesterol. Increase the risk of coronary artery disease apart from others. Medical nutrition therapy is the cornerstone of reducing eleva elevated blood cholesterol and LDL cholesterol to, de to reduce the risk of coronary heart disease. Next. So whenever we manage the obesity, always we start with the diet, exercise, known pharmacological techniques, and then of course we go to the drugs. So that is the usual mode of action. So start with the nutrition. Nutritional, it should address three major nutritional factors. That the patient is taking high intake of saturated fats, high intake of dietary cholesterol and imbalance is there between caloric intake and energy expenditure which has resulted in obesity. So these three factors has to be addressed and patient has to be convinced and told. Next. And what we can do, weight control, naturally we have to uh, advise increased physical activity and dietary modifications. Next. A diet with less total fat, saturated and cholesterol is recommended for all healthy Pakistanis two years of age and older. You know atherosclerosis actually starts at the age of 10 years. Uh, I'm sure there have been many lectures on obesity and this has been uh, uh, time and again uh, emphasized. So even small children, it's recommended that now no more of uh, too much saturated fats and cholesterols. The same diet is recommended the first step in lowering cholesterol in patients with elevated cholesterol, triglycerides or both. And uh, these are just trials, so I'm just uh, run through it next. Right, so in the, here you can see that what is actually recommended. So there should be daily physical activity, bread, pasta, rice and uh, some of the English foods and potatoes. So uh, uh, this is actually they are showing a daily recommendation with uh, and uh, I mean uh, how much you have to take. These things you have to take daily, which is below this line. But of course, in moderate quantities. Olive oil or olives are very good for health. Vegetables very good for health. Beans and fruits and uh, cheese and yogurt can be taken in lesser quantities. Then weekly you have to take fish, poultry, eggs and uh, sweets, not too much, but of course uh, you, you can go on with uh, as long as you are staying normal. And uh, monthly, some amount of meat should be taken. And with six glasses of water daily. Naturally, this is from an English size, so I wouldn't recommend this. <laughs> Next. And you can see all healthy foods there, which we take very little. Maybe we don't get all those fresh things around or whatever it is, or the liking is not there, but then this is all very fresh foods. Next. So after going through the nutritional management, you have to think of the liking, you have to make, you, uh, sometimes you have to address the patient to um, go to a nutritionist. Nutritionists are not very many in this country, but in Dohor we do have a handful of nutritionists because uh, currently there is another program going on by the name of uh, TNT, Total Nutritional Therapy. I don't know whether you have attended any of those, but uh, again I am one of the facilitators and coordinator to that program and we are holding it in different cities. So uh, there we usually get a lot of nutritionists attending that programs and uh, um, there I mean sometimes if the patient is affording he wants to really address you can refer a person to the nutritionist so that they can sit and analyze and take whatever they take a long time planning a dietary plan which of course you may not be have so much time but in general you can give them a tip that whatever is good for health is fresh fruits vegetables less of fats, cholesterol, and just weekly quota of uh, the things which I just mentioned. Then daily exercises, good. Again, you have to think if the patient has comorbid conditions, you have to uh, individualize the patient. Sometimes if you start saying you have to go for a walk half an hour and the patient will say I've got osteoarthritis of both knee joints, can't get up, can't walk. So then you look at their face and then you think what, what can I do next? So that is why if a good history is taken and you make up your mind that now what I can advise to this patient. And uh, then of course if the patient does not 
have any uh, contraindications to it, you can always advise good exercises. It tones up the muscle, it prevents the cramps, it uh, decreases the requirement of insulin in patients with diabetic, it tones up the heart, it decreases the tachycardia, palpitation, sweating. So there are lots and lots, especially exercising early morning. Uh, it releases opiates, which uh, decreases the depression. If you take a long walk, you see you feel much refreshed, uh, uh, refreshed and you forget your uh, troubles because the um, opiates and other secretions in the body is giving you much bigger and decreasing all those things. So exercise is again, I mean, beneficial in more ways than one. Then in management, lipid lowering drugs got a major role. Statins, this is now uh, coming up with so many evidence-based medicine, simvastatin, probastatin, and others so much coming up, atorvastatin. And uh, it's also available over the counter medicines in countries where prescription is a must because of its very good beneficial effects. Then life is inhibitors. Or only stand, it's uh, maybe coming up now by the name of Zenicol, uh, where uh, it can uh, decrease the absorption of the fats. If the patient cannot stop his diet, at least he can take a tablet with the diet. And uh, the, just like we have uh, A carbos for diabetes, uh, this is uh, uh, early stat for hyperlipidemia, and this can also help in reducing the weight. Another drug by the name of azetamide can be combined with statins as an adjuvant therapy and it decreases effectively the cholesterol, triglycerides, hyperlipidemia and this is used by the general practitioners. So it is not a specialist thing and it is very simple to use and it will decrease the dose of the statins so that less mild GIs and other side effects may be noted. Fibrates very much in less in fashion, but patients who cannot tolerate or contraindicate to statins, they can still, I mean, still it's being used in small number of cases. Frequent monitoring of the patient is important. You don't lose contact with your patient. You have to think, you have to make your patient understand that whatever they are doing, you are looking and you are analyzing and the patient should be boosted up, should have some incentive that, oh, that's good even if you have lost half a kg or one kg of weight or whatever it is. And outcomes of the treatment is your success. If you are successful in decreasing the weight and lipid profile and making the patient better, a very frequent question asked by the patient is that for how long do I have to go on an antilipid treatment? So you can't actually measure the time. You have to say initially for three months and then you will redo the lipid profile and if the lipid profile is coming up normal then you can reduce the dosage but you can't stop it altogether because otherwise the whole thing will come up again. And you have to, if the patient is very, I mean, aggressively managing the lifestyle and the dietary maneuvers and other things, you can give him of hope that of course your dose will go very low if you are looking towards all the other parameters but if you are not then of course you have to take be more dependent on pills uh, next so just uh, exercises next and this is just a summary now of the metabolic syndrome we're just coming to the end the metabolic syndrome predicts the development of both diabetes and coronary heart disease Insulin resistance, obesity characterizes most individuals are still subjects with the metabolic syndrome, although not required features of the NCP metabolic syndrome. Initial therapy should consist of caloric restriction and increased physical activity exercise. Conventional cardiovascular risk factors such as lipids and blood pressure should be treated in individuals with the metabolic syndrome, although no recommendations have so far suggested intensification of risk factor management. No consensus exists on whether insulin sensitizers should be used in non-diabetic individuals with the metabolic syndrome. As a diabetologist and as interested in diabetes, we are, uh, I mean, facing a lot of problems because, you know, there is a uh, concept of DPP, Diabetes Prevention Program, where the very high incidence of diabetes is there and you must have had some lectures on diabetes with the growing incidences in Pakistan. Pakistan is one of the countries which is, I mean, really convicted with a very uh, high rise in the diabetes. So metformin you can use, but uh, the other insulin sensitizers like the spioglitazones or rosiglitazone, they do not still have a role. And uh, so that is with the metabolic syndrome because it exists with hyperglycemia and hypertension. Next. 
So that is it if somebody just keeps on relaxing, the wife will be worried about the husband. Right, thank you. Thank you.